Hi there, Malcolm here with my 189th booktube video and today I'll be bringing you my March wrap-up and April TBR. I managed to finish 13 titles in the month of March, totalling 2,814 pages and 43.3 hours of Audible. And that puts me 2,852 pages up on the same time last year. Doing well. So that's all books to get through, so let's get cracking. So What If is Marvel Select What If Miles Morales, a series of stories featuring various iterations of Miles Morales if he were Thor, the Wolverine, Captain America, the Hulk, and himself. Each one with a reason as to how he became that particular hero. And then it's all tied up as each version bands together to fight the various iterations of their uncle, who's Prowler in the normal Miles Morales universe. A whole lot of fun, some really clever ideas in this. Very nice artwork, it's very clear what's going on and who's who. Booktastic. Really, really appreciate this one. I love the What If uh, TV series on Disney+. Plus both seasons. I certainly think as a genre, what if, there are uncounted possibilities of what you could do. And as long as the stories are told well, then keep doing it. But yeah, really recommend this one. Absolutely loved it. And after that, I then read Machine Vendetta by Alistair Reynolds. This is book three of the Prefect Dreyfus Emergency Trilogy, which itself fits into the Revelation Space series. I can't really review this one because I can't really say anything without spoiling anything that happens in the previous two books and this one. Highly recommend reading this though. Booktastic. And I have done a individual video on Alistair Reynolds as the second of my series of why I read science fiction. Yes, I've finally done the second one. So I'll leave a link to that below for me to talk a bit more about this and, and everything else Alistair Reynolds related. And after that, I then read Simpsons Comics Extravaganza. I'm going through my rather hefty Simpsons collection now. This collects uh, the first four comics of the series featuring The Amazing Colossal Homer. The Amazing Colossal Homer where he gets embiggenated and runs right down the high street of Springfield. Cool Hand Bart, where Bart gets uh, put in prison and ends up in a chain gang and escapes attached to Sideshow Bob. The Springfield Puma, the Springfield Elementary mascot goes missing and Bart and Lisa try to discover just what happened and some rather disturbing revelations about Martin Prince come to the surface and it's in the cards where Bart gets hold of a baseball card in an interesting way. A whole lot of fun, really enjoyed all, all the stories in here, plus the mini extra stories in the back of each one and the funny little one page, things like Bart's Bottom 40 and weird little adverts as well. Worth buying. And after that I then read Simpsons Comics Spectacular, featuring B. Boppa Lisa. Lisa records a track with her saxophone. It's accidentally played on top of a actual band's uh, recording and makes a lot of money, and of course she wants in on it. The greatest dull on earth, Simpsons go to the circus, except Homer's barred from last time. I shrink, therefore I'm small. The Simpsons do inner space, and the purple prose of Springfield, where Lisa gets her diary published, not knowing that Bart has made some rather interesting changes to the content, and it becomes a bestseller. Again, a whole lot of fun. Extra little funny things and adverts and lots of extra bonus content as well. Worth buying. And after that I then read Simpsons Comics Simpsorama featuring Fallen Flanders. Flanders goes missing and then returns as a complete dick. Has he had a personality transplant or is he an imposter? Survival of the Fattest, a reality TV type show in a survival dome, sees the Simpsons pitted against the Flanders. Where one family is particularly competent and very good at everything they do, and the other one isn't. But you can guess which one's which. Give me merchandising or give me death. Bart's popular homemade comic is stolen by a corporation and goes mainstream, but he doesn't see a penny of it. And to air is Homer. Homer somehow manages to inherit the Duff Brewery. Things go pretty much in the direction you expect. Again, four great stories, lots of extra fun content as well. And I should say so far that all the stories in the books I waved at you, feel like episodes from the show. And they're all completely new stories, but they have that genuine feeling that these could be 25 minute run animated. So worth buying. And after that, I then read Blue Mars by Kim Stanley Robinson. I listened to this on Audible, and it's the third 
and final book of the Mars trilogy. In book one, Red Mars, Mars gets uh, landed on and they start colonising it. And then it's full of the intricacies of trying to survive and the should they, shouldn't they terraform the place. Book two, Green Mars, is set quite a bit later on. Terraforming has happened. Lots more people are settling on Mars and Earth is going down the drain quite rapidly. And in both books, there's a revolution and an attempt to secede from Earth to become an independent planet in its own right, beholden to no one. And by the second book, everything is more or less wrapped up. So Blue Mars is a continuation of the story of people settling. Uh, it's less about the planet and more about the people. Uh, there's, a been a, there's a longevity treatment that's come into play, meaning that uh, the characters that survived from the first book, from the first hundred, are 150 years old or so. And they're having issues with memory and sudden death, mm. called the decline. And so we follow the dwindling survivors as they're coming to grips with the new reality, population issues, Earth still having trouble. And I couldn't help but feel that this trilogy should have just remained as a duology. Um, Blue Mars was very readable and I do like most of the characters in it. It just, it felt unnecessary. It didn't really further the story that much. There were the highs and lows, but it didn't really go anywhere. It was just you know, a, a day in the life of living on Mars as an extremely old person who can't remember anything. And certainly I found that Sax's character became the more predominant and more interesting of the lot as he's interested in everything, wants to find out more about everything and when he puts his uh, wandering mind to it he can pretty much achieve anything he wants. And his antagonistic relationship with Anne does come to a very satisfactory conclusion but I don't know it just felt unnecessary. It's worth reading but uh, purely for completeness sake. Wasn't as good as the first two. And after that, I then read Simpsons. Now, I've moved on from Simpsons at the moment. Halo, Contact Harvest by Joseph Statton. And this book chronicles the uh, beginning of the Human Covenant War. It's set on the planet Harvest, and there's First Contact, hence the title. Very cleverly done. And we follow Staff Sergeant Avery Johnson as he's sent to this planet to train some recruits, only to find there's a bit of piracy going on in the area, but it's not human pirates. Yeah, really good. I really enjoyed this one. A lot of fun backstory telling us why the war started. Certainly through the course of the games, you do get an understanding of why, but you do get an understanding of the fact that the war is based on a lie. But you see the lie perpetrated. We do follow the Sun Sayum individuals who become, and it's pretty to say, face. Everything they believe is a lie. And so cover up the fact that everything's a lie. We're going to wipe out humanity, which is the proof of the lie. Uh, there's not much war in this one. It's all build up to it. In fact, contact doesn't really happen until the last quarter or fifth. But I really enjoyed the story throughout. Worth buying. And after that, I then read Simpsons Comics Strike Back. Four more stories. A trip to Simpsons Mountain, where Abe Simpson tells the tale of something to the rest of the family, but gets confused by various TV shows he'd seen. And so you have the Brady Bunch cut in there and various other shows he would have seen. Bit of a weird one because it didn't really go anywhere, but quite fun. Waitress in the Sky sees Patty and Selma get fired from the DMV and try their hand at various other jobs, particularly being air hostessing, which would mean fine, except they're not allowed to smoke. What's the frequency, Simpson? Similar to the episode where the Bart and Lisa take over the news station, again, the kids take over the entertainment station on the TV, and it's far more popular than any of the other crap that's put out, much to the chagrin of all the other entertainers. And get fatty. Springfield is labelled as the fattest town in America and are encouraged to lose weight to a particular target which is almost achieved except for one individual but you can't guess who that is. Again a lot of fun. I think the first one perhaps felt less like an episode although you do get those are three episodes and one episodes which are quite fun but it was a rambling grandpa Simpson one and it just felt a bit rambling that was all but Again, a lot of fun, lots of extra content worth buying. And then after that, I then read Predator Eye of the Demon, edited by Brian Thomas Smith. And I've done an individual video on that one, so I'll leave a link to that down below. And after that, I then read Simpsons Comics Wingding, where we have Don't Cry For Me, Jebediah. In order to try and write a interesting story about Jebediah, Bart cheats a bit and makes the statue in the town centre cry, causing a great uh, reaction in the populace. The artist formerly known as Bart. A popular singer comes to Springfield who happens to be Bart's doppelganger and the two swap places, both wanting to live like the other one does, to find that the other life has its ups and downs just like their own. Stand and Deliverance. Martin Prince, Bart Simpson and Groundskeeper Willie are sent to the wilderness for on a camping expedition. 
hilarity ensues. Little Big Mart sees Burns buy out the Quickie Mart and shape Apu into his image. And Bart de Triomphe, I think that's pronounced, it's French, sees Bart and Milhouse con uh, Krusty to take them to Paris. Two more of Bart's enemies, the French criminals, escape to try and capture him, aided by none other than Sideshow Bob. Again, five more stories that feel like the episodes from the show. Worth buying. Probably it's the last Simpsons for now. And after that I then read, and here's an editing intervention. I left out The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. I listened to this on Audible. It was a reread, but I hadn't read it since, I think Between the Two Towers and Return of the King was out in the cinema. So it's been a while. I always meant to reread The Lord of the Rings, but I always felt it a bit daunting as a task. But now on Audible I thought, well, I listened to Andy Serkis read it to me instead. So I did. Unsurprisingly, it was very Lords of the Rings-ish. And what I really looked out for actually was the differences between Peter Jackson's interpretation on the screen, which I've seen many times, including the extended edition and the original material. And I can see why virtually every single adaptation that's ever been, they've taken out bloody Tom Bombadil. Now, fantastic character, don't get me wrong, but uh, they Idiot doesn't stop singing for one second. And for me, if you want to communicate to me in any meaningful way, you don't sing. As soon as singing happens, my ears just shut down and I don't hear any words at all. You know, my music is always with a bit of a beat in it. It could be about absolutely anything I wouldn't know. It all sounds foreign to me. So yeah, there was an inordinate amount of singing. But apart from that, really enjoyed the story. And it's really aged really well. Now, for those who live under a rock, The Lord of the Rings is an epic fantasy adventure which sees a world in the grip of a great evil that's returning. And all that stands between its total domination and uh, the salvation of the people is a gold ring that is found. And all they've got to do is take it to a big volcano and chuck it in. Sounds easy, but there's an awful, awful lot of... Uh, baddies and land in the way. Uh, book one, The Fellowship of the Ring, is basically split into two parts. One, introducing the characters of the Shire, these hobbits, these halflings, as they then travel off to the land of the elves. A fellowship is, is created of nine companions to take this ring to this volcano, and off they go. Lots of wizards, dwarves, orcs, goblins, and singing. Yeah, I could do without the singing, but apart from that, absolutely fantastic. And I'm not sure because it was read to me, but it didn't feel as daunting as I made out. Booktastic. And after that, I then read Terminator 2 Judgment Day, the novelisation of a certain film of the same name by Randall Frakes. And I normally go for novelisations because they are based on an earlier draft of the script. Because they try and get the novel out at the same time as the film. But of course, the author is given the script and then the script changes later down the line. So the thing that's featured in the novel don't happen on the film because of the natural evolution of the filmmaking process. But it's also an author's attempt to try and emphasise more on the thoughts and feelings of the characters in situations which aren't necessarily always given across by a facial expression on screen. And I think Randall Frakes did a really good job of this one. I love the fact that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator is referred to as Terminator, not the Terminator or the machine. It's Terminator does this, or Terminator said this. That was an interesting... Uh, design choice there. Uh, whereas uh, Robert Patrick's Terminator is referred to as Officer Austin after the poor sappy murders right at the beginning. And needless to say the content in here is from the extended director's cut. So we have Carl Reese in the psych ward and we have the melty feet at the end so that John Connor can work out which of these two mums is the real one. Things that are taken out of the theatrical release which makes the film make no sense whatsoever. And obviously if you like the film then you know why not watch the film but uh, Reading it, felt like watching it, but with a bit of extra in it, so yay, worth buying. Finally, then finished A Curse of Krakens by Kevin Hahn, book three of the Seven Kennings. And I read this to my wife. This is an epic fantasy chronicling a invasion of two species of giants on the mainland and the uh, inhabitants' survival. It's a multiple point points of view story, how it's all told by a bard who's able to shape shift into the various different. Uh, characters and tells their story. What makes it particularly interesting is that the bard is only able to recount the tale in a certain order as he gets the information himself and so a lot of the accounts are months apart. Some of the later accounts actually took place before previously related accounts. And the, the third book actually does something slightly differently about halfway through where everything the bard has to say has been said and then uh, notebooks are given out to all the main characters to write it down their experiences of events going forward as they take the war back to the giants and what happens 
then on are then collected in in these different, different notebooks. So a really interesting storytelling style, absolutely brilliant stuff. My main complaint with book two is the same with book three, is because there's a big chunk of time between the publication of each book, it's been a while since we read book two, and it's been a while since we read book one, and it's a case of well, what happens previously, I just need a little summary. I know we just literally kick off with the next chapter without any recap, uh, which okay a lot of books do do that but um, it's sometimes nice to have a bit of re recap and it effectively makes the trilogy one big book um, it's one continual story there's no particular thing that happens in between each story that uh, okay that's the end of book one we'll move on to book two at the beginning of this phase no there's no phases it just continues but absolutely fantastic all really likeable characters uh, some great maps in it and this book finishes up with a chronological list of events. So not only ordering when things happened, but also at what day they were told as well. This to help keep track of when things happened and when we knew things were happening and when lies were being told because it was known that other things had already happened at this point. Yeah, there's, there's lots of levels to it. Brilliant stuff. Highly recommend this trilogy. Booktastic. So there you go. That's all my books read. And it looks like the camera's just about to go flat, so I've got to go and find a uh, charger. Right, so those were the books I have read and finished. On two books I am planning to read during the month of April. So first up, I want to finish Kingdom of Darkness by Andy McDermott. This is book 10 of the World Chase series. I uh, just ran out of month. I'm not quite sure why I didn't manage it, but uh, there was no particular book that I was struggling with. But uh, anyway, nearly finished it, but uh, just need a couple more days just to finish off this one. Uh, basically, uh, Nina Wilde is trying to find the spring of eternal life before a bunch of Nazis do. Exciting stuff. I'll tell you more about it in my wrap-up. Well, as I finish that, I'll then move on to my book of the month, The Terraformers by Anna Lee Newitz. Set roughly 60,000 years in the future on the planet Sask-E, or sask -E, by the locals. It is a planet that is owned by a corporation, as are the people who inhabit it, terraforming it and making it ready to be sold to prospective wealthy buyers and tourists. So really interesting ideas in this one. And after that, I'll then read The Sixth Extinction by James Rowlands. This is book 10 of the Sigma Force series. Similar vein to the Wild Chase series. There's a MacGuffin that's going to cause destruction to the whole world unless our heroes stop the bad guys getting it. Uh, it looks like there's some form of death buried under the miles of ice under Antarctica, which with the ice melting is going to come to the surface and kill us all. Sounds fun. They normally are. But once I finish that, I'll then move on to The Remnant, Book 10 of the Left Behind series by J.B. Jenkins and Tim LaHaye. Set after the rapture, the survivors are just trying to continue surviving while the Antichrist is stomping around causing a whole load of mayhem. And we're very much nearing crunch time. A lot of the books of the series so far have been rather bland with only sort of significant things happening toward the end. The previous book was much more intense and so I'm expecting a slightly more exciting read. I have read them before but it's been a while. And once I read that I'll then move on to Ultima by Stephen Baxter. This is a sequel to Proxima, another terraforming style story. In that one a bunch of people are sent to the planet Proxima to terraform it and we followed their adventures. Meanwhile a weird hatch has been found in Mercury. Stepping through it they find themselves on Proxima. There's a bit of colonizing going on but there's also some weird ancient alien technology thing happening and uh, this one we'll find out more about the hatches presumably now uh, some quite thick books i've waved at you so i'm not entirely confident of getting through all these but if i do get through this one i'll then move on to another thin one children of ruin by adrian trakowski and this is book two of the children of time series again another sort of planetary colonizing type one in book one children of time they come to colonize a planet it's already inhabited by a civilization of spiders and uh on this one, I think we go and find other terraformers on other planets who may have had more success or not. Really intriguing. So that's my main reading. I seriously doubt I'm going to get through all that. At least this month. I'm intending to read it, obviously. To my wife, I'm now reading Floating Hotel by Grace Curtis. This was nice sprayed edges. Look at that. Ooh. And basically it takes place on a space hotel as it travels from planet to planet. It's like a cruise ship, really. And we're following a bunch of people who work there. Now, we seem to have this day-by-day -day running of a hotel. It could be any hotel, really. It didn't have to be a space one. And there's some weird sonnets being written and posted to everybody. No one knows where it's coming from. Beyond that, I have no idea what this is about. But it's also set in a future where there's an empire and the emperor is very much anti art really uh stories about aliens or great intelligences or intelligences supposedly greater than the emperors are forbidden it's not really come into play yet but uh they just watched an old b movie which 
has been dug up from somewhere and there's a sort of slight guilt of having to watch something with aliens in it because like oh we can't possibly have talking aliens but yeah there's a lot of weird stuff going on this but uh so far yeah it's fine not quite sure where it's going to go enjoying it so far and i've obviously been reading some simpsons so i've got a few more to get through so i'll see how many of these bad boys i get through in the month of april i'm still reading the walking dead the fall of the governor part two by uh robert kirkland and jay bonanzinga while boiling the kettle i've nearly finished that actually so hoping to wave that at you next month and the stranger times by ck mcdonald to my son there we go i think that's everything so i hope you enjoyed that uh any questions queries thoughts then please do comment down below but as usual if you have nothing nice to say then please keep it to yourself thank you and until next time see you later